OWASP is a nonprofit that stands for the Open Web Application Security Project. DevSlop is only one of many projects with OWASP. OWASP is a community of developers, technologists, and evangelists improving the security of software through tools and resources. OWASP has 100 plus active projects and new project applications are submitted weekly. Projects are open source and are built by our community of volunteers, people just like you. Community and networking. There are hundreds of local chapters worldwide and thousands of members. Meetings are free and open to everyone. They include training, talks, and networking opportunities. Education and training. OWASP hosts many events each year. They are a great way to improve your skills, build your professional network, and learn about new trends in the industry. One of the many ways you can get involved is to become a member. The membership benefits include discounts for events and trainings, your own OWASP email address and Google Workspace access, a vote in our OWASP Global Board elections, and recently, OWASP added a brand new member benefit, access to hands-on application security training through the OWASP Secure Flag Open Platform. Join us and become a member today. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to the OWASP DevSlop Show. I am Nikki Becker. Thank you for joining Shanisa Cambrick and myself for yet another OWASP DevSlop Show. So, you remember today's guest from one of our previous workshops. At that time, Barack Schoester was the CTO and co-founder of Bridge Crew, which has since been acquired by Palo Alto Networks. Yay! Barack is now the Senior Director and Chief Architect at Palo Alto Networks, working to make cloud security and DevOps processes simpler. And before that, Barack held various engineering and leadership roles at RSA, FortScale, and IDF, C4I, and Cybersecurity Directorate. Barack is also an open source enthusiast who's based in Tel Aviv. Um, he's creator of the open source projects Chekhov, Air I Am, TerraGoat, and contributor to other open source projects. Welcome, Barack. Hey, everybody. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. How are you? Good, good. Welcome. How are you? Pretty good. Uh, ready for an amazing topic today. We're going to talk about some tagging frameworks and uh, some open source that we've created within Bridge Group to help solve those issues. Cool. That sounds tagging like a great is plan. definitely, yeah, tagging is a complicated one. I feel like everyone sort of has their own ways of looking at this issue. So I'm excited to see what you guys have. Sure. Uh, let's give it a go. So, usually, the thing that we will have is uh, a big confluence with a tagging strategy of the organization. Um, and what we're going to show today is our way to automate th those Confluence pages um, in CI CD pipeline using a new open source tool. All right, so let's give it a start. Um, like a lot of the security issues or cloud-related incident and response scenarios, our story begins with a log. Uh, uh, one Friday night, I got a message over Slack saying, hey, you have an unencrypted EBS volume on your AWS account. And that specific message was followed by a pager duty that kept calling and calling um, and then escalated uh, through the organization about the misconfig found in, a, in an EBS volume that is provisioned into my AWS account. And then we started as a team to try and find out what led to that issue, what led to that specific incident. Uh, I've asked who created that volume, and I investigated CloudTrail, which is an audit trail of every API call being performed to our AWS APIs, AWS account. And Nimrod followed by who tr triggered the release during Friday night. Um, and I've asked Guy, who is our SRE, um, who owns this specific AWS account because I was not familiar with this, with this account um, that had the unencrypted EBS volume. Uh, I also added the context that it, 142 engineers are using these AWS accounts and there are more than 50 repositories with Terraform code. A lot of them have EBS volume. Uh, can be or cannot be unencrypted. 
Um, and, and it was really hard to identify who's behind this, this deployment of a new volume. So Terraform is the infrastructure as code that we are using within Bridge Group. Um, but a similar process happens when you're using um, CloudFormation to deploy. You are not always seeing the user that have created the resource in code. And similarly, in serverless framework, which relies on CloudFormation, it's, and it's a similar problem across all three major cloud providers, AWS, GCP, and Azure. You get a service account that tries to provision um, a set of resources. Some of them can be misconfigured, and you don't have the context to who created the change, where did it came from, and how, how you should fix that at work and where. And that led me to investigating my security hub alerts within AWS config and some config rules. And I saw that this issue actually is repeating it on itself three different times. I have three EBS volumes. All of them does not have encryption turned on. Um, then I did what, what, uh, what I always do uh, or what everybody do when they need to get something fixed. I opened the JIRA. <laughs> and then a uh, guy who got this Jira assigned because he's the person that I know that is uh, most familiar with, with that uh, area told me, hey, I still have 50 repositories of Terraform. I really don't have a clue where this issue came from. And we, try, we tried to, to understand where, where did the change come from. And we ended up with creating more and more Jiras to the different 140 engineers trying to verify, hey, do you own this resource? Or maybe it's a, a different person in the room next to you or in COVID on, on a remote uh, location next to you. Um, and everybody, everybody got a, some JIRA tickets um, and a, a lot of pain and a lot of uh, disruption to their day-to-day -day work, trying to understand, one, if it's a critical volume, if, if it's really a, a, a business issue, and two, how to fix that. And so just, yeah, just to hop in really quick. So the problem here is that there's so much Terraform deployments going on that misconfigured resources are happening and you guys are trying to figure out who did what and is and what is this misconfigured device and is it is it critical? That That's where we're at? Yeah, so we really try to, at first, to, deci to decide who's the owner uh, of this right. resource. Um, and it's not only if you have Terraform, it's that I'm using Terraform because that's my favorite yeah, infrastructure sure. as code. But any of it, yeah. Yeah, uh, you just lose uh, the visibility to the owner because you don't have any more people going through the console choosing, hey, I want to provision this resource with this volume attached, where you have the tracking of, hey, it might be Nikki that have done that change through the AWS console. And are there Terraform logs that you could immediately search to try to get like quicker context than, than like, or is that just so hairy so, that? So Terraform uh, keeps a state file uh, and right. a state file has the connectivity between a code and a provisioned resource uh, with an ARN, for example, in, the, in AWS with an identifier of a resource. The thing is, if you have multiple states, and you don't have access to the state because state contains a lot of sensitive data. It might contain access yeah. keys and secret that you don't want to share really with everyone within your organization. So personally, I don't have access uh, to all of the different states across all of the different repos um, because I'm not responsible for the production environment of all of those in, uh, repositories. Right. So you're in a real problem here, right? Terraform's just doing its thing. You have no access to the state files. Resources are being sort of spun up in ways that are triggering alerts. And now everyone's trying to hunt this down to figure out how do we deal with this? All right, I see where we're at. Yeah, and it's like, um, so I think that uh, seven years ago when most of us was still on-prem using Windows, uh, you would see on the Active Directory logs um, a service account. And you would say, hey, who's this administrator? Who's behind this service account doing those funky things? And you just don't have a clue. Uh, so you you start at the bottom, you hit the first person you, you're, uh, you know, with a Jira, and then you go all the way to the top until someone tells you, hey, does it, it does make sense or it doesn't, or you should talk with, with X. Yeah, 
All right, let's 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 figure out how to solve this. All right. So uh, at the end of the, um, can you see my screen? By the way. Yeah. All right. So in the in the end of the uh, triage process, we ended up um, nailing down a specific resource within one of our uh, repositories. So this whole scenario and all of those screenshots are demo, but similar things might happen. You might end up in a code repo that you own that have provisioned this, this resource. And we see here that we have an unencrypted volume. And here, even the engineer have mentioned why it's unencrypted, because he didn't want, he or she didn't want uh, to delete uh, the volume with all of the data, because it was not encrypted upfront. Um, so it's a very long process. It's a Friday night phone call with a Slack thread where, when I need to tell the whole thing, hey, I need your help uh, to triage this, this thing. Um, the Jira is assigned and then reassigned and reassigned and reassigned. We find, finally find who owns this code piece, deploy a code fix, do a migration in this case, um, and we are in production without an, a, an encryption issue. So the response time is very, very long. If I knew upfront who the owner of that resource, I could have routed the pager duty alert directly to the user that owns it and probably uh, not annoy the whole team and uh, have, uh, have an email thread and a Slack thread with 142 engineers there asking uh, who, who owns this uh, thing. So. There, there must be uh, any, an easier way uh, to, to fix problems fast, especially when everything should be accessible and everything has an API um, and everything is managed in code. In our case, or most of the resources are managed in code. So there is a, a very nice paper by AWS called uh, Tagging Best Practices from 2018. And I know it's been uh, three and something years since it was released, but we really loved the tagging use cases and how tagging can help us solve that specific issue. So if we tag a resource owner, uh, we can start to create uh, um, minimum, minimal uh, or very small organizations within our AWS account saying, hey, I have a single AWS account that I have hundred engineer, a team of 100 engineers provisioning resources into that organization. But I can actually say, hey, this microservice tagged with a team tag is owned by that team with five or six or eight engineers. And I can also use tagging to opt in for infrastructure scripts. For example, if a resource is tagged with, hey, this is a development machine, I can turn it off during off hours, and I have an automation for that. I can use team ownership for access control to use IAM policies with conditions on tags like team, only allow to a specific team to modify resources in production or turn it off or on. We can use it for security risk management, saying, hey, this subset of resources are um, PCI critical or in scope for PCI audit. And I should harden those resources in, um, in a much uh, more robust way than others because security has cost. And cost allocation, since I have a team ownership, I can say, hey, ap application team number one can spend up until $100,000 a year and application team two can do twice than that. And operation support is the use case that we've started with. If I know the owner, I know who to who to ask when anything goes wrong. And when you want to enforce those best practices for those use cases, you really want uh, to decide as, as a whole company or a group or um, a product, a business unit, what are the important tags for you? Uh, because you want to, to have a consistent way to tag those resources to answer those business critical questions like ownership, cost center, um, and is it business critical or not? And Brock, just for the audience, the tagging capabilities at all the major cloud providers are pretty comparable. Is that? Yeah, so in all Google, it is called label. 
Um, and it is important to say that not all of the resources are taggable. So in AWS, there are something like 260 taggable resources, and there are about 300 and something uh, resource types. So not everything is taggable, but we do see that the API changed over time to enable tagging on all of the different resources, even legacy ones. Um, so even if it's not completely there, it's like 90% there for most of the common ones. Cool. All right. um, and, and, and you have this discussion. Quick, I'm sorry, quick question on my end. Um, so you mentioned about security related to tagging. So can we restrict who can access certain functionality based on those tags? Yes, you can definitely do access control policies like AWS IAM policies with conditions over tags. So I can say, hey, Barack is the user that is not allowed to touch production anymore because he crushes stuff all, all of the time. Or only Barack can modify those resources that he owns. And what about informing <laughs> policies? So, you know, preventing what can be pushed to production, for example, can you use tags in, in that way also? So since we're using infrastructure as code in, in this case, um, you can say, hey, I want to create a condition where only um, Terraform, for example, uh, which is our service account, let's say, uh, assuming that you're not using roles but access keys, um, can um, do a specific set of actions within within my AWS account, and I can use SCPs for that also. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Um, and, and, and you're having this discussion, like the questions that you, you have asked of, hey, what can I tag? What is important for me to tag? And what's the use cases? And you should have this discussion as a team in your own company. Um, and you should focus on what's required and you should always have for tags and what should not. Um, and the reason for that, it's not always easy for an engineer that is writing this piece of code to, to know the context upfront uh, for those, like, who's the cost center if there is a joint project between two different uh, business units? So you should at least tag one or have a direction. Uh, tags can al always be modified and changed, but the goal there is to start somewhere. Um, and if you're using infrastructure as code, you have the opportunity to do a lot of those tagging uh, processes very early on in the development life cycle. Um, and if you have untagged resources, those can be easily remediated. So you, you can use, if you're managing your cloud infrastructure uh, through the console only or on runtime only without infrastructure, so there is an amazing project called Cloud Custodian. And you can use that for tagging runtime changes. But if you're using infrastructure as code, doing runtime remediation, um, interferes with what you have defined in code, which is breaking the state, which would break the next deployment or might break, break the next deployment of infrastructure as code because you have inconsistencies between code and cloud. So the way to do that is remediate always on code, on infrastructure as code. So let's, let's see how we can make it so. So we've decided to open source your um, so Yor is named after the Time Traveler comics from, I think, the 50s, uh, but also uh, uh, on a Star Trek uh, character from last season uh, for, for a, a person or an alien that travels between, between times. And Yor is our tool to travel between dimension, between the code dimension and, and the cloud dimension and apply tagging policies on our infrastructure as code. So it allows you to have automated process to add tags to your infrastructure as code in your CI CD pipeline. And it also has some baked in best practices with auto taggers that exist within it uh, to follow ownership and tracing. And we'll see how, how, it, how it works today. Um, it currently supports three infrastructure as code framework, Terraform, CloudFormation, and Serverless. And it's going to support Kubernetes soon, so stay tuned. Um, so let's uh, let's see how uh, how to do that. Um, you start with brew tab to bridge brew tab and brew install your, or you can use the Docker if you're not using Mac. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, show in a, in a minute a demo for that. Um, so your has a set of fields that should be added to each and every infrastructure as code resource. 
that will help us understand where did a resource in runtime in our cloud environment is coming from code? Where, what repository did it come from? Who did the misconfiguration? How do I fix it? Uh, without access to state or sensitive data, or without the need to do endless triage uh, on JIRA tickets. So the EBS volume that I've talked about on our incident, you actually can automatically add on, without me typing those fields manually, uh, the commit that the resource was sourced in, the file path that it was sourced with, in, when was the git change, who's the user that had modified that, now I know that it is Nimrod, um, and what repository, and also it has a trace identifier. Even if I have multiple resources modified on the same commit, I can uh, say, hey, I want the specific resource identifier, and I want to find it both in code and in cloud, and your will give a, a unique identifier without access to state. So on my AWS account, on, on, on that volume, I will be able to see the tags of those resources, and I can easily track down Nimrod, who's the responsible, Nimrod Core at Gmail, who's the responsible for that specific misconfig. So I don't need to go and open a set of JIRAs and endless Slack messages and PagerDuty. I can actually do even an event rule in PagerDuty saying, if Nimrod is the owner, call Nimrod. Don't call me on Friday night. So dumb question, Brock. <clears throat> Git tags, are those, like, what if they're just not using Git tags? So um, I'm not using, so uh, Yori is using, um, the git blame history. Okay. Uh, and we are, I, git is the prefix uh, to add those as AWS tags. We're not using uh, release tags like the git tags that you've mentioned, uh, but we're using git data to create git related tags within your, uh, within got your it. infrastructure. Okay. All right, got it. So you're, you're pulling out git data to add those, to make new tags that could give you more context as to who owns the asset. Got it. So you don't yeah. have to have any Git tagging going on to make this happen. OK. Correct. Yeah. So if you have a process in your CI CD pipeline that always telling you, hey, if Nimrod have modified that resource, he's the owner of it, Nimrod doesn't need to do it by himself on each and every resource he creates. That's really manual and, and cumbersome. And uh, we wanted to automate that process. So whenever someone is opening a pull request, will automatically expand the infrastructure as code resources that are within that pull request and say, hey, please add owners, which is the Git modifiers. Uh, please add the source, which is the path to the file and repository. And please add the time of change, which is the time of the pull request. And, and using those fields, we can actually triage in, in a single operation, which is viewing the tags, where did this change came from? Cool. Yeah. Uh, so let's do some demo. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a sec and to pull up a terminal. Give me a sec. Right. Can you see my terminal? Mm, not not yet. yet. There we go. Yes. Who? Um, so the thing that I've done before this uh, talk is I've cloned a repository called Terago, which is a vulnerable by design infrastructure as code repository. Um, so I've cloned it locally. And the thing that I'm going to run now is I've already installed your. I'm going to show how I've done that. It's just by typing root tap bridge to uh, your um, and brew uh, install. And since I've done it before this talk, I'm going to show you how, how a resource is configured on my end on Terraform. So I have here, for example, an S3 bucket. Uh, this resource um, is public, it's unencrypted, it's not versioned, but I don't know who owns it and if I haven't told you, you wouldn't know that it's sourced from Terago um, or one of the other 50 repositories that I have. 
So I'm going to create, before doing any change, a backup file for that. So I have here two different files which have the same content, the S3 Terraform and S3 Terraform backup. And the thing that I'm going to do now is I'm going to ask your to tag the entire directory of resources. So I have here uh, a Terraform directory. And within that Terraform directory, I have resources from three cloud providers. And within the AWS directory, I have S3 buckets, EC2s, IAM policies, and more. So let's, uh, let's ask your to tag for us. So I'm going to type in your minus H. And there are a set of commands that I can type in. The first one is tags. There is list tags and list tag groups. Um, so let's do your tags. So your is telling me, hey, you actually have a set of built-in tags that you can use to tag your cloud environment. You can have a, a single uh, UUID for each and every resource, allowing us to easily find infrastructure config to cloud uh, matching. You have Git-related tags, which will add the Git organization, repository, file, commit, modifier, et cetera. And you can have uh, simple tags. Those are ones that I've configured within my environment, and I'm going to show you how I build that. So let's type in the next command, which is your tag. And I'm going to see the help guide for that, too. I can actually tell the your tag, hey, I don't want all of those different tag uh, mentioned in the list tags operation to be tagged on my infrastructure as code resources. I can skip a specific value or choose only a specific one or skip a directory. Um, but I'm going to go simple for now. I'm going just to tag the entire directory with all of the different tags that I have. Um, and I, before that, I'm going to uh, export an environment variable uh, called simple tags, and I'm going to make it empty. So Barack, you mentioned um, a user could skip certain variables if they choose to. Could you always go back and reinstate those? Uh, yes, yes, you can, you can always go back and, and modify your CLI command to, to change okay. them. So, Having a simple tags environment variable is saying, hey, on top of those Git-related resources that are using Git blame history, um, we'll add also a, a, a team tag saying who's the owner of those. So I can say uh, your tag in SD, uh, which stands for directory, and tag everything under the current directory. So this process uh, is taking uh, a few seconds. And let's make the screen a little smaller. And I'll review with you the results. Oops. So the output of your is actually a table stating what are all the changes that it has done um, on the last execution. And I can see that the uh, your command have scanned 98 resources and have added traces, meaning tags, uh, to the last, to the 64 out of those. And that's because not all of the resources supports tagging, but most of them do. Um, so I'm going to see how, how this change uh, looks like for our um, S3 bucket. So to do that, I'm going to uh, see the diff between two files. I'm going to make it slightly larger. Um, and let's see. Uh, so I, he I have here the file on the right end before the change, uh, which has only name and environment tags configured. And after the change, I actually have already the git commit, the git file, the last modified by, um, and the repository. And I have also a unique identifier, which will tell me where this resource have came from. So I haven't done manual edits to 68 different repositories, uh, 68 different resources. Now I can; those were automatically being updated because the thing that you have done behind the scene is um, a Git 
history command. So if I do uh, git, uh, git status, I can see all of the modification that you have made. But I also have a way to see uh, previous uh, commits using git log. Let's see. And for each and every commit, you have do done uh, a back in time inspection saying, hey, who owns this resource? Who's the last one that have modified that? And that can be Barack, that can be Nimrod. Or if I want to aggregate those two under a single team, I can add a custom tag like team and have it across all of our um, resources or specific directory um, in our infrastructure code. So every time you do a commit, do you need to rerun? Like, does this does this refresh itself on every commit or? Yes. So your refreshes itself. You have to run it. Uh, you have to do uh, your uh, tag uh, for this directory on each and every commit. So in case you have started um, to to do code modification on the same code base, it will add Nikki, for example, to the modifiers list. So Got we it. know okay. that both of us are now the owners of that resource. But let's say that our team have expanded and we decided to split the team into two teams because of nat natural growth of business. Uh, so I can actually do uh, a, a, a custom tagger in Golang, um, which will tell me, hey, whenever you see Barack's name or Nikki's name, go to Active Directory or Okta or wherever I'm managing my teams, it can be in GitHub also, and say, I have a new tag, which is called team, and uh, use this tag whenever you see Nicole doing a, a commit. Got it. And then you just, your responsibility is to rerun your every after a commit. So in your pipeline, you'd be like, okay, rerun your, get the new tags, and then those, those fire off into the cloud. Exactly. So let's see how it looks like when, when we fire those uh, really uh, up to the cloud. So the thing is, if you're doing a change and I'm doing a change, who is going to be the, the owner? So also before this talk, I don't want to do a Terraform apply because it's going to take a while. So I'm going to show you how it looks like on a provision cloud environment and how I'm using that to track, track down the ownership. So I'm going to stop the share screen and share a new one. All right, cool. So I have here um, resources within AWS Config. Um, AWS Config is a recording tool within uh, the AWS console. And it helps us to understand uh, what was the state of each and every configuration um, along uh, a long time since you turn it on. So it, it is a recorder. And you can set up a bunch of config rules on top. And over here, I have within AWS config, a set of, uh, let's go to the dashboard, a set of uh, non-compliant rules. And I also have the unencrypted EBS volume and I can see on which account it is provisioned. And I can see that I have multiple resources and I'm going to um, go to one of them and see who owns uh, this one. So give me a sec. Just need to type in a uh, password for a session that have ended.
All right. I'm going to share my screen again. Oh, can you see? Yeah, loading up. Yep. Yep. All right. Um, so I can see here all of the resources that were tagged using your. And I have Nimrod over here um, and the your trace. So if I want to say, hey, I want to know what are all of the resources that was provisioned on under the same commit, I can actually copy the git commit tag, type it in on the search across all of my repositories. And you tell me, hey, you have S3 buckets, you have EC2s, you have DB applications, and Kubernetes cluster, et cetera. All of those were provisioned on the same commit. It doesn't answer to me um, who would modify that resource because I have a lot of resources under the same commit, and I don't know if a specific change was sourced there. So I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to say, hey, I know it's under the EC2, and I know that I have a single trace identifier. So I'm going to copy paste that trace and type it in this repository. And here it is. Um, so here's the EBS volume. And I know that Nimrod is the last modifier of that EBS volume uh, because you have done that for me. So what's the flow to have, to have your managing all of those resources. You can do it manually, um, locally, or, or using a pre-commit hook that we run it for you. Um, and what I'm going to show is how you can configure it in a CI CD pipeline. So every time someone is doing a pull request, you will just add this data for, for that pull request. So here I have a repository with a set of GitHub actions that are pre-configured um, to run on every push to main or to a pull request, a pull request to main. And whenever uh, the resource are being added to that pull request, your will actually run using the GitHub action here. And we'll have another stage that is committing those changes. Let's hope the God of Demos are with us. Uh, we're going to do it live. <laughs> so you could run your as a Git action, a GitHub action, right? Which is the way you're doing it right now. What other ways can you run your? So you should run it either as a CI CD step. GitHub action is my choice, but you can also do it in Jenkins yep. or um, or any other. Um, and in a pre-commit hook, um, it will enable you just to see the changes locally before applying them sure. um, to your to your code base, to your shared code base. So those are the two recommended options. Yep. I would recommend to always have at least your in your CI CD pipeline. Cool. There was a few questions on that. So I think we got those answered here. So thanks. I'm going to show uh, a diagram to explain that in a sec. So right. the thing that I've done here is I, uh, I have an S3 bucket. And I'm going to uh, just the default private one. I'm going to add that here into a new file, call it S3 Terraform, create a new branch, propose a new file, and create a pull request. While that's happening, I am going to show the flow, and we're going to repeat into that CI/CD pipeline in about a minute uh, to see the results after it have executed. Because I have here currently a workflow that is running that is going to take about uh, a minute. So the flow that you you've asked about that is happening is a, a developer is doing a commit. Um, a pull request is being created if you're working on top of GitHub. Your, um, on our case, using GitHub Actions, will add a set of tag changes to add um, all of those traces. And from that moment forward, I can merge my code um, and apply to production knowing that all of those tags exist. Even if I want to have a larger set of tags uh, that my organization have defined in a Confluence page or a Jira page of, hey, whenever you're doing a cloud change or a cloud provisioning a new cloud resource, you should have those list of tags. Your is the tool to help you automate that without needing to worry and going back to that Confluence page. Let's see how our actions uh, is being doing uh, so far. Um, so over here, Right. 
here, I have the file changes to that same S3 bucket. And new tags of your were added, the git commit, the git file, the last modified by, and the modifiers, uh, which is me, because I created that pull request. So it's a GitOps way to have your resources, your infrastructure as code always traced. Um, the CNCF have created, or a project in the CNCF is called um, Open Tracing. And that's a very useful tool for application tracing. Whenever you're having one microservice, for example, written in Java, talking with another microservice written in Python, you can have a full trace showing the logs and metrics of all of the interactions of two or more microservices. And you're always trying to apply a similar, a similar aspect uh, for tracing code to cloud resources in a GitOps manner, where each and every uh, code change is actually being inspected and edited by your editing those best, pra best practices tags into your code. So on the commits history, you will actually see another commit by your itself that have added and modified those, those tags. Does that make sense in Mara flow? Yeah. <clears throat> so I guess if the Terraform script is spinning up, like let's just say it's doing some Kubernetes building or something that generates a lot of cloud infrastructure, like dozens and dozens of resources. <clears throat> I guess the thinking here is that you at least know enough to know the source repo that created this thing or these things so that you could then, I guess, evaluate the, you have accountability, you have a human maybe that you can go ask questions to, and you have application context. So you sort of know somewhere where, you're basically narrowing this down. Is that is that a correct understanding? Yes, so you're narrowing down cost center if you have a simple tag turned on, you're uh, narrowing a user that have modified the change of the repository right first that that change and then right. if you so if you see a bunch of ec2 nodes you might say all right that's part of this kubernetes cluster and it's not just an ec2 that's running you know that context now it's an eks node um even though it's looking like an ec2 node correct um yeah. so, and and you know the person behind it and that's what it, important in a lot of cases right create. Cool. I have a question. Um, so if I wanted to see all of the items that Janisa had touched um, and what they were tagged with, is there a way to do some type of mass reporting, for example, maybe? Great question. So what I'm going to open now is a tool within AWS called Resource Groups, and there is equivalent on GCP and Azure. Um, and Resource Group is actually an inventory query tool uh, where you can ask, hey, show me all the resources that answer a specific call. Um, so let's, let's run it without um, too many restrictions. I'm going to choose uh, all resources here, which is chosen by default. And I'm going to ask, hey, um, give me all of the resources that were modified by Nimrod Core. And I'm going to preview that. And it's going to show me all of the different resources that Nimrod have modified. And I'm going to add um, some of those your related tags to the preview screen and remove some of the non-interesting ones. So here I know that I have a security group within the uh, EC2 service that was sourced from this file and modified by this user. And I can ask using resource groups, what are all of the resources that were modified by Nimrod or, or a, a different question, for example, cost center, et cetera. Yeah, and so one other question came to my mind from a, a governance standpoint. So as you're deploying new functionality, um, what do you propose as best practice to go back and look at tags to make sure that you're covering everything? Or what should be a baseline set of tags you should be using? So, great question. Uh, <laughs> the thing that you should agree on is what are the processes that you should have in place in any of the cases 
uh, that were mentioned before, like cost questions, um, responsibility, security scope, ownership. Those are the kinds of questions that you would like to ask yourself uh, before applying a tagging strategy. And it, it's actually where um, one of the points are in the best practices of tagging is that you should decide as a team what are the tagging best practices and you should apply those across the stack, across all of the, your application, application teams. Um, so one of the concepts that relates to that uh, question is that if an application team builds a resource, the application teams should also own and run this resource and manage that. And your is a tool to help you automate the process of identifying who's the owner of each and every resource. Um, on top of your, you can use applications like PagerDuty to auto-assign teams uh, to alerts, and the teams might be a tag on the payload of the issues that you have. And you can also enrich your policy engines. So we talked a lot about runtime alerts, but there is another open source tool uh, that was mentioned here in the previous talk named Checkup, policy as code tool. Uh, there is also other policy as code tools that are open source that you can use. And you can use Checkup and your together to allow um, ownership or tagging related uh, resources. Any tag ownership is just a use case using your and Checkup together. So you can actually ask, hey, I have this cloud trail and it has three modifiers within the tags uh, key, uh, Steve, Barack, and Matt. And I can write a policy saying, hey, allow only security team members to edit cloud trail configuration. So I'm not part of the security team, but Nimrod, Rotem, and Noor are. So we have defined an array of who's uh, part of the security team. It can be also an Active Directory query. We're just trying to simplify here in the example. And we can ask, hey, is the Git modifier within the code part of the security team? And the answer here is no. Steve, Barack, and Matt are not part of that security team. So I can actually fail a build or fail, fail a code change if Barack, Matt, or Steve is trying to apply a change to that Terraform resource. And on top of that, I can also create a similar policy on runtime. I can say, hey, I want a runtime IAM policy restricting who can start or stop an instance. So uh, if I've created an instance, uh, I don't want anyone else to stop or start it for me because I own this EC2 instance, this uh, uh, virtual machine. And I would like to restrict the action of starting and stopping that instance only to myself. So the concept here is if you tag and label everything, really everything, you can have those policies in place. But you can also start with a single VPC or a single AWS account or a single microservice to have those best practices in place, uh, which will help you with use cases like cost allocation, security risk management, access control, et cetera. So, before we'll dive into what's next, any any questions? I think <clears throat> there's just one more one question I see around. Um, if you could just go over the difference between formal Git tags and the Git tags in this context, just one more time. Yes, sure. Uh, so, um, so your is actually uh, using uh, Git related tags. We can call them labels. It's just uh, a matter of speech. Um, and those labels are helping us to identify um, things like ownership, team, or any custom tags that I would like to apply. And regular tags, like Git tags, are meant to be uh, deployment markers or release my markers saying, hey, a specific um, version of the code should be tagged with a set of release notes on that tag. And we can see here an example from one of my repositories. Um, this is not related to the infrastructure as code tags, but it's the entire code repo tags. It's not tag of a specific ownership or a label of a specific ownership on a specific code block. 
because right. a lot of times in a single repository, for example, here we have about 100 different developers, contributors, modifying this code base. If I'd like to uh, track who modified each and every resource, that's uh, a custom level uh, labeling uh, on top of my infrastructure as code that Yor is helping me to, to identify. All right, I think that's clear. <clears throat> there was just a question around around that. Um, all right, follow up. Can the labels Git tags be missing and the release markers be missing? That's just a question. So I guess if, you, if you're not tagging at all, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're not looking at Git tags, period. We're not using Git tags, we're using Git blame history and we apply them into tags. So yeah. if you're using Git, you'll always have a Git history or a Git log that we can rely on to apply Git labels on top of your uh, infrastructure as code. So if you, you have a team of 20 modifying Terraform code um, for different applications and you want to track down who's owning each and every resource, that's the way to do that. And if you're using Git, you will be able to do that for you. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks. So your helped us with various scenarios, operation support using pager duty routing, cost allocation using custom tagging of cost center or team, um, risk management, mean time to response, and access control, and even policy engines. Uh, and what's next for your? Uh, so your is going to be relatively larger. Um, we mentioned uh, a Golang related uh, extension in this talk. Um, so your can have a custom tagging logic in code. And we're going to expand that feature, not only to Golang code, but also to YAML. So you can say, hey, if I see Nimrod's uh, user actually tag the entire security team in an additional tag, or if I see Nikki, uh, allow or disallow a set of specific tags. So the YAML extension is going to support that. We're going to support another set of infrastructure as code manifests, which is Kubernetes related ones. And a feature that can be done on top of your is you can actually identify drifts between code and cloud without access to state, without doing a plan, because you can match always using the your trace a code instance on whatever repository it is being defined and the runtime instance or instances in case of an array after it was provisioned. And uh, it's open source and other Apache 2 license. So you're all very welcome to, to join the party. <laughs> cool, is there any, um, if people were to use this and they had like, are there any sort of features you're looking for open source help on or committers on or PRs on? Um, so one of the things that we would love help with is uh, integrations to things like Okta or Active Directory to do all the upgrades to do some, some of those enrichments. Um, and also it should be relatively easy. And if it's not, uh, please let us know to add other infrastructure as code manifests. Um, so we started with three, but if you want to join the party of uh, working on the Kubernetes one or Helm related one, uh, you can always ping me on Slack at uh, slack.bridge.io. Cool. Yeah, I could also see some use cases for things like integration into ServiceNow. <clears throat> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds scary. This is great. But, yeah. No, you're like the open source uh, toolsmith here, Brock. Uh, yeah, trying, was... trying to have fun. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I think we are. Let me just check the questions here. Um, we have just thank yous in our question uh there's no, really no questions anymore i think that is what i'm seeing thank yous that's what i'm saying all right you have any uh last comments here brock on the project anything you want to talk about um you're really all welcome to join the open source we're really accepting most of the uh pull requests and feel free to reach me out either on twitter or the slack channel cool 
All right. So I guess for the audience here, we are next weekend, May 23rd. We are doing, yep, a free workshop with Rosemary and Tracy from HashiCorp to explore policy as code for infrastructure. So please join us. Um, yeah, it's going to be a good time. Thank you.